It's really a, a pleasure to, uh, and an honor to be here, and I want to thank the committee for inviting me to speak on intraoperative MRI. Um, I have no disclosures. Uh, learning objectives, uh, upon conclusion of this lecture, uh, the audience should be able to um, uh, have an understanding of the various types of brain tumors, uh, the risks and benefits of radical brain tumor resection, and the technologies available for the safe resection of brain tumors. So I'm going to focus today on primary brain tumors, and primary brain tumors as opposed to metastatic brain tumors, which start elsewhere in the body and travel to the brain. Primary brain tumors actually originate within the brain or in the meninges, which are the covering of the brain. There's an annual average incidence of uh, 21 in 100,000 um, tumors per year. So it's not a large uh, major public health crisis the way stroke or breast cancer or heart attack is. And there are approximately 65,000 cases per year. This is a pie chart of the different types of tumors. The most common tumor is actually a meningioma, which is almost 36%, and it's that uh, greenish area. Those tumors are benign, and a, a lot of them are actually just left alone. Um, if they occur in uh, somebody who is not really having any symptoms from them, and it was discovered because they hit their head or something, um, we typically actually leave those alone. Um, and they are benign tumors, so surgical treatment is typically curative. Uh, the second most common type of tumor is a glioblastoma, and I'll be showing you a number of cases of those. And those are uh, highly malignant tumors with an average uh, life expectancy of about 15 months, and uh, those are a little bit of the tumor types that Dr. Chang touched on this morning. Uh, pituitary tumors, which Dr. Jones gave an excellent um, talk on, is, is about 15 percent. And then there's a scattering of other tumor types. This, is, uh, this will tick off your uh, gender discussion on your CME forms. So most tumors are actually more prevalent in men, with the exception of meningiomas and pituitary tumors. And it's thought that meningiomas have some uh, growth receptors for estrogens, which uh, make them more likely to occur in women. Uh, but there's a lot of controversy over that. Um, nevertheless, it is, it is uh, clearly more common in women than men. Uh, there's a growing consensus that the more tumor you take out, the better the patient does. Now, I say a growing consensus because no one's ever really proven it. The best way to show that would be to do a randomized trial where you took out all or most of one patient's tumor and randomized the patient to having just a little bit of tumor taken out and see which patient did better. So that obviously is unethical, and that trial will never be done. And so we have a lot of... Um, anecdotal evidence, but we also have a lot of uh, sort of longitudinal evidence to show that the more of a tumor you take out, the better patients do. And so within neurosurgery, there's this concept of maximal safe resection. Dr. Chang actually touched upon maximal safe resection as well. And maximal safe resection means you take out as much as you can, as safely as you can. Uh, it's dependent on the, the ability uh, to locate the tumor within the brain and distinguish it from normal surrounding brain tissue. Uh, you need to minimize the removal of surrounding normal tissue to avoid causing new neurologic problems. I actually had a colleague who once talked about brain tumor surgery in a general surgery grand rounds, and he said, you know, brain tumor surgery is very, very tricky. It's not like general surgery where you can just cut up the abdomen and go muck around. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they pull their intern for the month. Uh, so... <laughs> so uh, uh, the um, preoperative MRIs are critical in uh, determining the relative size, location, shape of a tumor, and they're uh, obviously necessary for pre-surgical planning. In the days before MRI, we had CTs, uh, and then before then, we had uh, air, air pneumograms, I guess, uh, would also help tell you at least what side of the brain the tumor was on. Um, there's a story about Harvey Cushing where he actually operated on the wrong side of a uh, Harvey Cushing is one of the founders of neurosurgery. Uh, he uh, w diagnosed a patient with a tumor, and he was really one of the most astute clinicians of his time. But he, uh, he, he opened the patient's uh, skull. Uh, there was no tumor, took out, uh, opened the other side, found the tumor, took it out, and he told the family afterwards, I got all of the tumor out, and good news, there's no tumor on the other side. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I guess you have to think quickly on your feet before you see the family post-op. So, 
So um, the, the current state of the art in terms of trying to locate a tumor within the brain is obviously to do an MRI, and then I would say that most uh, neurosurgery, uh, uh, neurosurgeons in this, in this country have access to what we call a stereotactic navigation system, and it's like a GPS system for the brain. And this is just an example to show how it works. This is a patient who uh, presented with this tumor, and it, it looks like a, a schwannoma, uh, perhaps, uh, coming off one of the cranial nerves, but it looks a little bit odd. Uh, the patient was placed on steroids and was sent to, um, sent to me to have a uh, resection. So I got a preoperative MRI, and this is what happened to the tumor. So this obviously is a lymphoma, because lymphomas actually do melt with steroids. Um, we could have kept treating the patient with, lymphoma, uh, with steroids, but uh, steroids is not a definitive treatment for lymphoma, and it actually matters what type of lymphoma the patients have, because there are different subtypes, and different subtypes are sensitive to different types of chemotherapies. So uh, it was still recommended that this patient undergo a biopsy, but I was a little bit concerned that I might not be able to find this tumor, because it is, it is relatively small, and so I used a stereotactic navigation system, and this is, this is how it works. So there's a, uh, on the left, the left side of the screen is actually the patient who's been draped and prepped, and in, the ha in, in my hand is a stereotactic probe. And on the right side are two images from the computer screen that we have, and, and the probe would be the car, and the uh, patient would be the map, and on the right side, that's what you would see in your car. Uh, so you would see a map, which would be the MRI, and you would see your car, which would be the probe. And by pointing that probe, I can kind of see where within the MRI I'm going. And so it is really like a GPS system. So we did a craniotomy and opened up, and that's the fifth cranial nerve there, uh, the white structure. And so you can see that the cranial nerves are pretty small, so the tumor is actually pretty small as well. And to make sure that that wasn't just a bump in the dura and that, in fact, that was the tumor, uh, I stuck a probe on it, and this is the probe here. You can see barely that this is the metal. It's, it's an odd angle, so you're seeing, you're seeing it foreshortened, as they would say in Art 101. And uh, this is the tumor here, and you can see on the GPS map this, this, this uh, uh, virtual probe pointing uh, to the MRI that was done before surgery. And so it all matches up, and we were able to take the tumor out. So the, the stereotactic navigation system has really uh, simplified or revolutionized in many ways brain tumor surgery. The main drawback of the stereotactic navigation system is that the MRI is done preoperatively, and as soon as uh, you do a craniotomy, uh, it's like opening the lid of a vacuum jar. Uh, the air sucks in, and everything inside shifts. And so on the left side here, this is an axial a T1 contrast enhanced MRI scan, and so the top of the head is here, or the nose would be here, the ears are here and here, and this is the back of the head, so the patient is lying on the table. And this white area here is the tumor, because it, it uh, takes up the contrast. So I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but this is an interoperative uh, image of this patient's surgery. And uh, you can see here, what this is is air. So once the craniotomy is done, this air uh, gets sucked in, and the whole brain shifts. And so remember, the GPS map was obtained before surgery, and so now that the landscape has shifted, uh, that map is no longer accurate. And so that's really the main drawback of the uh, stereotactic navigation system as it's used throughout the country. So to overcome this concept of brain shift, uh, the intraoperative MRI was developed. This was the, the first intraoperative MRI was uh, developed or invented in Boston at Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, and I think this opened in 1994, and the design at that time there was what we called a double donut. So this is a magnet, this is a magnet, the surgeon stands in between here, and the patient is slid in through the, the mag, this, this is actually a donut that you're seeing on end. And so the patient is slid in through the hole of the donut, and then the surgeon, the head, the head is kept here and the surgeon operates through there. And so this really was, was quite a, a technical, logical advance. Um, the original pictures are in color, but I used Photoshop. I made them black and white. I blurred them just to give you some historical perspective. <laughs> so, 
Uh, so the, uh, what you can see here is that the, the, uh, the donut actually is draped because this is the operative field. So these are drapes on the donut. Uh, the, the surgical instruments are here. And because they were in the same room, they were all titanium. They were non-ferromagnetic. As many of you know, titanium instruments are very soft, and so a lot of the instruments that we would use in the standard operating room were not available to us. We used to say that we would gnaw at bone. You know, we have these crunchers that are really hard, but the titanium ones are soft. We instituted the, the standard stereotactic navigation system as well, so we can, the surgeon could look up at the screen. Uh, here's the scrub tech here, and you can see that the back of the scrub tech is also gowned so that he can turn around uh, and face the instruments as well as the surgeons. Uh, this was another drawback. This is actually my back, and you can see how big that I am. Uh, I wasn't much bigger back then, although I have stopped <laughs> lifting weights, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, but it was a tight space. Uh, the other main drawback of this was that it was a 0.5 Tesla magnet. So Tesla is a measure of the magnetic field strength, and the stronger the magnetic field strength, the more detailed uh, or higher resolution images you can get. And this was a 0.5 Tesla magnet, and it had to be 0.5 Tesla so that you could have all of this other machinery and equipment in the room. And, but the images were blurry. So this was a great uh, first try, and then the intraoperative MRI technology evolved. Uh, various companies jumped on board. This was made by GE. Uh, this, I think, is the EMRIS system. So this was a, a variation where this magnet here lives in what's, I think, what they refer to as a garage, and it comes out onto, uh, it comes into the regular OR onto this track. So during the surgery, the, the surgery is done with standard instruments, and then uh, when it's time to image, they open the door and they, they, they drag this thing in on the tracks. And I, these are the tracks here, and then I think it docks onto the table here. Um, the strength of this magnet was also limited because it had to be mobile. Um, so the, again, the picture quality was not uh, very high resolution. This was the next iteration. So this is the uh, type of uh, operating suite where the surgery is done in one room, and this is uh, an operating table. Um, this is a standard operating room. And then the patient is uh, transported from this room uh, through this door into the other side where the magnet is on a trolley. And this is, the, uh, this is the other room where they came from, and then the patient is uh, scanned in the MRI. And this is the uh, design that, the, that Cottage Hospital has adopted and instituted. So there are a number of MRI, uh, intraoperative MRIs through the, throughout the world. I, my rough guess is maybe 20 to 30 uh, throughout the world. And so there have been uh, a number of studies to show whether this is a useful technology or not. This is a low-grade glioma study. Dr. Chang talked about low-grade gliomas and the importance of getting a good resection. So this is um, by Elizabeth Klaus, who was at Brigham and Women's, and this is a Brigham and Women's study. And it was a retrospective study. Remember, I said that no one will ever do a randomized prospective study uh, de deciding whether or not to do more or less surgery. So this is a retrospective study of 156 patients. They underwent resection of a unifocal uh, supratentorial low-grade glioma in the intraoperative MRI. And what they did was they compared the death rates or the mortality rates of the patients who were operated within the intraoperative MRI, uh, which is in this column, uh, and compared that to historical controls. This is data from the Central Brain Tumor Registry of the US. They're the ones that made that pie chart in the beginning of the talk. And you can see that the one-year uh, rate of mortality was only 1.9% versus 12 to 26. At two years, only 3.6% of patients uh, had died versus 18 to 38 in the historical group. And at five years, uh, less than 18% had passed away versus 31 to 53. So the authors uh, conjectured, uh, speculated, I guess is too weak of a word, uh, that because they achieved more complete tumor resections, that that's why patients did better. And so again, they, they had to conjecture or speculate because they really couldn't prove it. Um, they, it wasn't really a true study. So this is low-grade gliomas. This is malignant gliomas. This is that, uh, I think, 17 or 18 percent piece of the pie that I said these are malignant gliomas or glioblastomas. It's uh, the same type of tumor. 
And in this study, they did uh, do a prospective randomized trial, but for other reasons, which I won't get into, uh, but they took uh, 58 patients with contrast-enhancing tumors that they thought, that the surgeon thought, I think I can get it all out. And so if, if a surgeon, or if a patient showed up with an MRI where the surgeon thought I can get it all, they were entered into this study and actually randomized. Uh, 24 of 29 patients were randomized to the intraoperative MRI group, and 25 of 29 patients were randomized to the standard neuronavigation group, which is the, the use of that standard system that I showed you earlier. Uh, complete tumor resection was achieved in 96% of the patients in the intraoperative MRI group, while only 68% of the patients in the control group were uh, achieved a gross total resection, or at least it looked clean on the MRI. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of weaknesses to this study because the, the surgeons are not blinded to what they're doing. Um, they know that they're in the intraoperative MRI, they know that they're using the standard system. And so there may have been a little bit of bias where the, pa the surgeons who were in the intraoperative MRI maybe were more aggressive, uh, maybe a little bit less aggressive. So it's a good study, but it's not uh, really a, a true uh, randomized trial. I thought this was very interesting. This is a pediatric study from St. Jude's uh, Hospital. And it's a single institution study of 191 patients who underwent uh, intraoperative MRI surgery over a two-year period. So once they installed their intraoperative MRI, all tumor patients had surgery in that intraoperative MRI for two years. And residual tumor was detected in 21% 21, uh, 21 of patients uh, intraoperatively. So the, the surgeon took out all the tumor they thought that they should. They did an intraoperative MRI. And 21% uh, of those patients actually had more tumor that the surgeon was not aware of or didn't think was tumor. Uh, and then had further tumor removal if they thought it was safe. In pediatric tumors, the two main types of pediatric tumors, uh, ependymomas and medulloblastomas, there have been multiple studies where, uh, that have shown that if you get all of the tumor out, that the patients, the children do much better. Uh, so much better, in fact, that uh, when a patient had a surgery for one of these tumors, they would get an immediate post-operative scan uh, even that afternoon if it was done in the morning. And if there was more tumor, they would be taken back to the operating room that evening or the next day. That's how important it was to get it all out. So prior to the ins installation of this MRI, um, they found that, uh, well, so what I should say is the early reoperation rate for patients who uh, had, operated, had gotten operated in, in, in the intraoperative MRI was 1%. So 1% of the 191 patients had to be taken back to surgery uh, even though everybody thought the surgery was done. And the reason that was done is because the patient had a tumor type that was thought not to require total resection. And so the surgeons weren't very aggressive, and then the pathology report came back later saying that, oh, this is one of those tumor types that should be taken out. And so that's the 1%, the one patient who actually had gotten taken back. And so it, it was a, an essentially a 0% reoperation rate, whereas in the two years prior to installation of the MRI, they had an 8% reoperation rate, where 8% of patients, they finished the surgery, got an MRI after surgery, there was more tumor, and the patient was taken back to surgery immediately. So that's the early reoperation. So this is, to me, a very powerful study. Even though it's not rigorous, I think it shows uh, how much patients can be helped. And then this is a review article of pituitary tumor surgery uh, in the intraoperative MRI. And uh, in this review, 24 of 24 studies showed that use of intraoperative imaging uh, to improve a surgeon's ability, or in 24 of 24 studies, surgeons claimed that there was a uh, positive or more complete resection because of use of the intraoperative MRI. And in those 24 studies, the range of patients who benefited from having the intraoperative MRI was 15 to 83 percent. And then there were two of two studies comparing intraoperative MRI to endoscopy uh, for the visualization of residual tumors. And the two studies determined or concluded that the intraoperative MRI was actually very valuable for tumor, particularly if it was located lateral to the uh, cella, so around the corner. Uh, or in the cavernous sinus, or in the supracellar space, which would be up high, 
where the endoscope, if you have an angled one, you can kind of see up there, but still it's not, uh, you can't uh, see as well probably as an MRI. And I can show you an example of that later. So this is the intraoperative MRI at Cottage Hospital. This is the operating room portion of the suite. Uh, this was installed in February of 2015, and it's really a state-of-the-art operating room even by itself. This is the uh, intraoperative MRI portion. This is right next door, and patients are wheeled in here, and that's a uh, MRI-compatible anesthesia machine. Uh, and the patients, uh, that trolley is docked, uh, docked onto this table here. Uh, and then the patients are scanned. So I'll go through some case studies of patients who have been done at the cottage. Uh, I used to give this talk, and I'd have to use patients from NIH and the Brigham, but now I have cottage case studies. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is a patient with a known anaplastic, as, uh, anaplastic ependymoma, uh, and this is, again, a, a T1-weighted contrast-enhanced axial scan. Again, the top of the head, uh, top, the front of the head is here, the back of the head is here, ears are here and here. And so this uh, tumor here, this enhancing area, is the recurrent tumor. This dark area is the previous resection cavity. And so this tumor has recurred in this uh, cavity. And then this is just a surrounding edema. And this is the intraoperative scan where I thought I had gotten all the tumor out. The patient is actually lying on her side uh, during the surgery because the, the, the way to take this out is to come from this, in this direction. So the patient's head is actually sideways, but the MRI makes it straight up and down because that's the way we're looking at things. So that's why there's this dark air. This dark area is air, and this is fluid because the air settles above the fluid. That's why you have this funny line there. Um, and so the intraoperative scan, which was obtained after I thought I had gotten all of the tumor out, confirms that the tumor is gone. And this is a follow-up uh, MRI scan obtained, that I think, about a month later, and it shows that the tumor is indeed gone. So this was a good use of the intraoperative MRI. This is a patient with a glioblastoma who presented with confusion. Uh, and, and the reason is that this is in the dominant uh, left or dominant parietal lobe at the left side on a right-handed patient. He also had, signif he had a significant visual field deficit where uh, he couldn't really see the right side of the world. Um, so this is a sagittal MRI. It's T1 weighted. Here's the eyeball. The back of the head is here. The top of the head is here. The nose would be here. And here's the neck down here. And so this white stuff is the tumor. This is the preoperative scan. This is edema around the tumor. Uh, this is the intraoperative scan. And you can see that there's uh, quite a divot there. Uh, but there's this rind of white stuff here. And so that's residual tumor that I didn't realize was tumor. I thought it was just maybe, um, you know, a scarred brain or, or, or I wasn't quite sure what it was. But because this is in the dominant parietal lobe, I didn't want to cause him any more significant cognitive deficits than I, than I needed to. And so I, I didn't take this out initially. But after having gotten this MRI, I realized that I had left tumor behind. And so I, I, we put him back, uh, we, we brought him back to the regular suite, and I took more tumor out. And this is his postoperative MRI one month later, which shows that this rind was now taken out. There's still a little bit of faint enhancement down along here, but that is adjacent to his visual cortex. Uh, and so I didn't want to worsen his visual field deficit, and so I purposely left that behind. You can kind of see that there's a little bit here, uh, and I left that alone. Uh, because the, uh, statistically, if you can get out, quote, 98, 99% of a tumor, uh, they'll do just as well as if you get 100%, because in reality, we're not getting 100%. Uh, and so quality of life, obviously, is very important to patients, uh, and so I wanted to try to preserve as much vision as possible, so the decision was made to leave that alone. But without the intraoperative MRI, this would have been left alone as well. This is a pituitary tumor. This patient presented with blindness. Um, this is a coronal uh, contrast-enhanced MRI. This, this is the pre-op scan. And so the top of the head is here. We're looking straight forward at a patient. So this would be the, the patient's uh, right, uh, right ear would be here, left ear. And this is a tumor here. And the optic chiasm is somewhere in here, and it's crushed. 
Uh, this is the carotid artery. Here's a carotid artery here. And so this was removed uh, using a, a standard transphenoidal approach. And I actually use stereotactic navigation uh, to do these cases, but um, it's not a big distance uh, in from here to here. And uh, in all reality, the, the guidance system was probably a little bit off. I thought this was the middle, but in fact, I was off to the uh, right side a little bit. And so when I approached through here, I took out a whole bunch of tumor, and it felt like it just kept coming and coming. And I thought, I must be done. Um, but we got an intraoperative MRI, and lo and behold, there's a huge chunk of tumor here that's extending up here. And the tumor up here probably would not be visible with an endoscope. This, this tumor here with an angled endoscope to the side probably would have been visible. Um, I used a microscope on this case. but. Nevertheless, this would have been an embarrassing post-operative MRI for any surgeon. Uh, so uh, thankfully, we had the intraoperative MRI. I noticed that there was more tumor there, and I took out more tumor. And this is his post-operative scan. And I don't know how well it shows, but here his optic uh, chiasm uh, has been restored. Uh, and his pituitary gland, which was saved, uh, comes down long here. His stalk is along here, and then the gland is sitting there. And so this, again, was a great use of the intraoperative MRI. And this is the last case. This, again, is a, a patient who um, presented with um, a little bit of weakness and confusion and headache. And this is another coronal image, just like that MRI image was. So uh, top of the head, uh, I guess this would be the uh, right side, left side. So this is non-dominant hemisphere, which is why the patient didn't have any speech problems. This is the enhancing tumor. This, this white area is enhancement. This is a necrotic center. Uh, this patient had surgery in the intraoperative MRI. Uh, in cases where the tumor enhances, uh, we typically do a pre-contrast uh, pre MRI to see what, see what uh, blood products there are. And then we do a post-contrast MRI. We do another MRI uh, to see what's enhancing. So this is the pre-contrast MRI. And in the time that it took to get a pre-contrast MRI and get a post-contrast MRI, this, this, um, this, this stuff here doesn't really show up here. And so uh, we weren't quite sure initially what it was until we figured out that this is hemorrhage. So this is another great use of the um, intraoperative MRI is it actually will detect intra, uh, intraoperative hemorrhages, um, which obviously need to be evacuated. So this uh, post-contrast intraoperative MRI shows this hemorrhage here, which is the white. So what this is is the contrast is leaking out of whatever's bleeding here and just filling this cavity. So this is actually contrast uh, mixed with blood. And then if you look in the corner here, there's a little rim of enhancement, which was the whole purpose of getting the MRI was to look for enhancement, and that indeed is enhancement. And so the hematoma was evacuated, and the contrast was removed. And this is the post-operative scan about a month later. And so you can see that that's been removed. So the intraoperative MRI, is it really necessary? So uh, the analogy I give, give is if you're renting a car, there's some options you want, just some options you don't need. There's some options that are ripoff. <laughs> so additional driver, free, right? Satellite radio, you can listen to local radio or sing. <laughs> so I wouldn't pay for that. Extended roadside assistance, the car shouldn't be breaking down. <laughs> Fuel plans, rip off. <laughs> GPS, though, if you're in a new city, you really want to know where you're going. It's the same with surgery. If you're going to be operating in somebody's brain, you want to know where you're going. You want to know what's left. And so I would definitely recommend GPS navigation. So the intraoperative MRI, <laughs> it's not the standard of care, but it sure is really a great technological advance, I think, which really benefits patients. So in conclusion, uh, intraoperative MRI can increase the extent of resection of tumors, uh, especially tumors that grossly resemble normal brain, uh, tumors that are located deep within the brain. Um, and so tumors that are located deep within the brain, in the course of getting to that deep tumor, you're disrupting the brain around it and throwing off the preoperative imaging, or tumors that have irregular shapes where you're going to have to really dissect into various little corners of the brain uh, with some trepidation, but it's a lot safer with the intraoperative MRI. Uh, the intraoperative MRI can improve patient survival and quality of life secondary to increased extent of tumor resection, and it can prevent the need for early reoperation of tumors. So.